Hi. <laughs> the weird thing is, I'm only 38. <laughs> hey, let's make some noise to thank Pip and his team for putting on this great event, shall we? There's a tension that happens between the experience that a designer brings to a design and the data that the systems can show about what's going on. And we're going to explore that. To do that, I want to go back to 2010, when a designer from Sydney, Australia, a guy named Luke Stevens, decided that uh, it was time for him to write the book he'd been wanting to write. He was going to write a book on using data in design. And the book that he was uh, going to write was going to talk about all the ways that designers can benefit from this. And so he did what all good first-time book authors do when they sit down to write their book. He decided to work on his personal website not work on the book, just the personal website. And of course, to make it justifiable as a procrastination tool, we've learned that that's important here, uh, he decided that he was going to actually make two home pages for his new uh, personal website, and he was going to A-B test them. So the first home page would describe the book. It describes the book. It has a place to put in your email address, simple call to action. The second home page, he would decide to be radically different. In this page, he wouldn't describe the book. He would just say, hi, are you a designer? I've got a book coming for you. Put in your email address, click the button. And the two of these designs, he then put out into the world and had about 500 people visit each one. And sure enough, he saw a difference. His thinking was, when he put these out, that more people would gravitate to the book description site. Because after all, the book's going to be awesome. They would want that. The other one is too general. But the data, the data showed that, in fact, that site got 33 email addresses, whereas the other site, got 77 email addresses. So immediately, he thought, ha, huh, once again, data uh, trumps the instinct of the designer. That in this case, the data told us what was going on. And of course, that second design was the better design for this book. But embedded in that thinking that he put into a blog post, were a couple of statements that really jumped out at me. The first one was that more email addresses are better. That, in fact, collecting more email addresses is the sign of success for this campaign. And the second one was that all email addresses are equal. That when you have an email address, that's the goal. And, of course, what that doesn't take into account is what I believe he inevitably wanted, which was to sell more copies of the book. So the question is, which design would actually, once they received an email describing the book, which one would sell more copies? It's very possible that the first variant would sell more copies of the book even though the second variant collected more email addresses because the people who put their email address in the second one wouldn't be interested in the book. They don't know anything about it. The people in the first one would. So it's very likely that would work out. Unfortunately, we'll never know. He never wrote the book. <laughs> he keeps telling me he's going to. But I want to take these email addresses apart for a minute because they're really interesting to me. We have two different types of information here. We have the actual email addresses that were entered, and we have the assumptions that Luke Stevens made about the meaning of those email addresses. 
And we actually have technical words to describe what these things are. We can call the email addresses observations. We didn't actually see people entering the email addresses, but we did see the database get populated with email addresses, so we assume that it wasn't bots, that people actually did this. And we have these assumptions, but they're not observations. They're something different. They are inferences. And inferences are the meaning that we bring to the observations. They help us understand what the observations are trying to tell us. And these two things, observations and inferences, are absolutely critical in understanding what data tries to talk to us about. We have to know which parts of these are the observations, the actual facts that are pretty much incontrovertible, and which things are inferences, the opinions that we overlay on top of that, that data to explain what we're seeing in the world that we're in. And we need these things in order to make design decisions. Design decisions are absolutely critical to our ability to change what's going on. And even if you're not the designer on the site, Chances are you are contributing to the design decisions. You're bringing the data to the table to make those decisions. So in my world, anybody who is contributing to the design decisions, they're part of the design team. They are, in essence, a designer just like everybody else. So the design decisions are what's key here. And we go from observations to inferences to design decisions. And this framework turns out to be really useful. We can start to actually lay out what we're doing. And a lot of teams don't do this, but we find that when they do, it brings a lot of clarity to what's going on. So in the case of Luke Stevens, we can say, well, the observation was that the second variant collected more email addresses. The inferences that he brought to that was that more, inference, more email addresses are better, and therefore the decision was when he would go live, he would actually use that second variant. Very common trail here. And basically what we've done is we've separated out what did we see, why do we think it happened, and how will we improve this? So let's now go back to 2004. This was the website that Wells Fargo Bank rolled out in 2004. And I know it doesn't look like much now, but at the time it was revolutionary. To put it in perspective, the previous version of this website had a grayed speckled background. And this website had a lot of interesting new and novel things, the use of integrated graphics, the ability to log in on the home page, uh, uh, the use of segmenting the links in boxes using visual design as an element, and the search box. The search box was the first time that appeared on any site on a home page. Up until this point, the search box was always a button that you clicked, and then you got a second page that said search. And the team was really interested in this, and this was also the first time they really were able to collect data and start looking at it. So they, this was their first dive into the data. And the team that had been working on the search capability was absolutely fascinated by what were people searching for. And they went into the search logs to find out what are the keywords people are searching for. Their thinking at first would be that it would be the automatic teller machine, uh, uh, locations, or maybe it would be uh, the rates for loans, or maybe it would be the instructions on how to apply for a mortgage. What were people searching for? And as they went into the logs, they were completely astonished to find out that the most searched for thing was none of those things. The most searched for thing was nothing. Blanks. Not all, but many of the search log entries had nothing typed in. So then the question became, why? Why are people not typing something in? So the team went off to try and figure out the answer to that. And there were basically four theories that surfaced. There was a big group of the team that believed that it had to do with the login form that there was something broken with what's called the focus. Basically, you would put your cursor in the username field and you'd type your username, and if you're used to a keyboard, you'd hit the tab key and you'd type in your password, and if you hit the tab key again, it would actually transfer the focus up into the search box. 
Not where you wanted to go, but if you didn't think about it and you just hit enter at that point, you would actually conduct a search that would be blank. So they thought maybe that button focus was broken. But there was another group that thought that it had something more to do with that blank box. This was a novel design pattern. No one had seen this before. And maybe users didn't know they were supposed to type. Up until this point, even on Amazon, the way you would, you would get to this is you would, you would press that search button. So they thought, OK, maybe people are pressing search without entering any text. There was a small group, but strong-willed, that absolutely believed that this was the problem of not having advanced search. They knew it down to their core. Every user wants advanced search. And they were clicking on search to get to the advanced search often so they could enter their booleans. We had, I had a participant in a study once say, I need that booleen thing. And I go, booleen? Booleen. It's like some sort of non-fat ghost. And then there was a couple of developers who actually thought that the software for the vlog file was broken, that in fact people were typing things in, but the data wasn't getting into the file, that somehow there was a bug that was just putting blanks in the field. So here we have it, four different possible outcomes. So we can put that in our framework, right? Our observation is that the log file is filled with blanks. We've got four different inferences, but we don't know which one it is. And what's really important here, and this is the critical thing, depending on which inference turns out to be correct, there are actually four different things we would do to the design. We could just take it on faith and do all four, but that's expensive. Or we could figure out which inference it is. And the way to figure out which inference it is, is in fact to go with further research. Now the Wells team did something that a lot of teams don't do. They didn't stop at the first inference. Most teams that I see have the habit of stopping when they get to the very first inference. And because they stop at the very first inference, they don't know what the other options are. And they just go and plow through that and make that the design. And that works against them. So the best designers never actually stop at the first inference. They keep saying, well, what else could it be? What else could it be? What else could it be? Get all the inferences on the table. And that's what the Wells team did. They sat there and got on the table. But then they decided to do some more research. They brought people in and they watched them actually use the search. And what they found was, in fact, people didn't know at the time to type in the query. There was a large percentage of their users that were not digitally savvy that didn't know that was the way that worked. So suddenly, because they knew that, all the other inferences go away, and all we have to do is work on attaching a label to that box. That solves the problem. And the basic lesson to get from this is that we can turn our inferences into observations by doing research with our users. By actually watching them work, we can see them go ahead and actually use uh, the design. And from that, we can establish why things are happening. We can get to that question as an observation, not as an inference. Now, I've been doing a lot of work with metrics lately, and I want to I do a little experiment. I have collected data from four popular websites, from the way the home page works. So I have collected a particular metric about the home page of four sites, Snapchat, Airbnb, Uber, and Facebook. And you can see that Facebook has the highest metric, Snapchat has the lowest, Airbnb and Uber are in between. And I want you to guess 
what this metric is. I'm going to give you a hint. It's highly correlated with market valuation. Okay? So, what do you think it is? Just shout out some guesses. Number of logins, that's a good guess. What was the one over here? Revenue, that's a great guess. Number of users, that's a great guess. Word count, that's a close guess, yeah. Time spent on the page, that's an excellent guess. All of them are wrong. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to tell you now. It's the instances of the letter E on the home page. <laughs> Highly correlated with market valuation, particularly in this data set where I've cherry picked out all the websites where it doesn't correlate. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, let's go look. This is Snapchat, hardly any E's at all. Here is Uber or Airbnb. Couple more E's. Here's Uber with a bit more. And Facebook has E's out the wazoo. There you go. Here's the thing. Counting the number of E's is a stupid metric, right? We all know this, right? This is just, who would ever do this? And I'm sure that even though we say this, and I put it on a slide, I know I've given this presentation places where there's been some VC in the back of the room who called his portfolio companies and said, got to get more ease on the page, it's valuation. <laughs> Yet, this isn't any more or less stupid than many of the metrics we already track. It turns out that we have no way of assessing whether a metric is good or not. And let's hone in on this particular word here, metric. Because this is a word that we bandy about, we use all the time, people seem to use them interchangeably, but it actually means something specific. It's actually distinguished from the word measure. A measure and a metric are two different things. A measure is something that we can count. And a metric is a measure that we track usually over time. So we can actually see if a metric changes by counting the same thing repeatedly. There's a third term that we often use that is also important to have a distinct definition, and that's analytic. And analytic is a measure that the software can track, because software can't track all measures. And this becomes really important because we need to actually have accurate metrics, and sometimes the analytics will not get us those metrics. But we also need to be able to separate out the metrics that are useful and good from the metrics that are like counting the instances of the letter E that are stupid. So let's look at one. I'm gonna start with time on page. Time on page Somebody actually shouted this out, right? Is, is, is when we go to a lot. How much time do the users spend on the page? And on its surface, it feels like an important number. But what does it actually mean? So this graph behind me is a graph of an article that uh, was on our website, very popular article, for, for over two months. And this chart shows that on December 17th, something weird happened. So how would we explain that spike on December 17th? Any guesses? I'm sorry? Very few people visited, so that would send the reading time up. Yeah, that could be it. Why, why on that day there were fewer people? What would we do differently? I don't know, but that could be it. What else? Slow servers. Could be that slow servers make the time on the page be slower, but you know, for some reason it's just that day, and oh my God, if my servers were that slow that, that, that it shot up four times, I, 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 I'd have to go find an administrator and, and winch them or something. What else? Bad data. Bad data. But if the, oh, that, that's an errant data in the log. Yep, could be anything, right? 
But what, it does, what none of this tells us is what we're supposed to do differently. Right? My theory is, is that December 17th is the day people have to pee more than any other day. Because getting up to pee will cause your apparent time reading. Because we actually, time on page is, is an equivalent of the time the browser has open on the page. Oh, and by the way, depending on the analytics tool in the browser, it actually means different times. So it could be as cut off at 30 minutes or it could be cut off at three minutes. We don't know. Right? So we actually don't know what contributes to that number. We don't know how it's counted. We don't know anything about that number. But we are damned if we're not going to use it for something. We're going to say, look at that day. We have to fix the servers. They're slow. Shoot somebody. Right? And that's the problem with time on page. Time on page is not a useful number. It does not tell us anything. And it turns out, it is in a collection of lots of useless numbers. In fact, almost everything that the analytics tools, like Google Analytics, come out of the box are equally as useless in that we don't know how they're collected, we don't know what they're actually measuring, we can't tell if every person's met doc data is in there consistently, and we actually don't know what it's trying to tell us. Every single one of them. Let's take the old whipping boy of SEO, bounce rate. Here's bounce rate for the same period for the same page. Apparently, that slowdown on December 17th did not affect bounce rate. And we can see it hovers at about 90%. It stays at 90%. That's great, I think. Or that's awful. It's one of those. <laughs> I'm absolutely sure it's great or awful. I call these types of measures agenda amplifiers. They amplify the agenda of the person giving the presentation with the chart. I want you to know that we need to change the servers because the bounce rate is so high. If we redo the servers, we will be able to make the bounce rate better, I promise. And the executives go, yeah, bounce rate high, that's bad, we need to fix that. No, I want you to know that the bounce rate is high because users are finding the information, they're coming to the page, and they're leaving satisfied. We should make sure we have more useful information. Let's not play with the servers, let's do that. Yes, more useful information, no servers, got it. <laughs> right? Whatever the agenda is, we will use this chart to tell the story because this chart can tell any story we want because it does not actually tell us what we should do differently. This is the most powerful type of data on the planet because it bends to any need we have. Or as R.H. Coase once said, if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything you'd like. <laughs> so while we all love Google Analytics and we particularly love that it's free, and it's free because we want them to know everything about everyone. <laughs> Google Analytics can't tell us what we need to make design decisions. They don't tell us what was useful about our content. They don't tell us who is coming to our site who's a big spender or what those big spenders do that lesser spenders don't. It doesn't even tell us why someone clicked. We can tell that they clicked, or we think we can tell that they clicked. We can't actually tell that they clicked because the data is inconsistent, but we, we think we can tell that they clicked, yet we don't know why. And we don't know if they had the same reason to click as anybody else who came to the page. Google Analytics does not tell us why. And without why, we don't know what changes to make in the design. We can put inferences up there, and we can run with those inferences, but those have nothing to do with the actual observations. But it's not just what's in the analytics. Conversion rate, the thing we came to this conference to learn about, turns out it's got issues too. Now at this point in the presentation, I often have designers in the audience, so I'm often telling them, don't be scared. 
but those number things are about to appear. <laughs> As you are aware, conversion rate is a simple formula. It's the number of people who purchase divided by the number of people who visit. It's a ratio, and that's a really important thing because ratios are a huge problem. Basically, we're talking about how many people visit, let's say it's a million, and we divide into that the number of people who purchase, simple enough, we get ourselves a nice, beautiful conversion rate. In this case, 1% when we have 10,000 visitors over a million, or 10,000 purchasers over a million visitors. 1% could be good, could be bad. We don't have any baseline for it, so we don't know whether this is a number we need to go up or down, though people rarely want conversion to go down. But the thing about that 1% is we use it as the way to tell if we're doing a good job. And the problem here is that we want to get this higher. So let's say we could get 20,000 people to purchase over a million visitors. Now we have 2%. Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. 2%, good. It's much better than that 1%. But as I said, this is a ratio. And because it's a ratio, we can actually get to 2% other ways. We could have a million visitors, with only, or half a million visitors, with 10,000 purchasers. And that is also 2%. So now we have two ways to increase conversion. Are both of them equally good? When all we talk about is conversion, in fact, it seems like 2% is always better than 1%, no matter what. But when we look at what the actual revenue is, let's say it costs $100 to, uh, for someone to purchase, so if our average purchase cost is $100, that means that a 1% conversion rate with our 10,000 purchasers, we have a million dollars of revenue. At our 2% conversion rate with 20,000 customers, we have $2 million, that's great. But in the first scenario, 10,000 purchasers, $100, now we have 1 million. And so that 2% increase is no longer necessarily a good number. It makes us get down to the decision. Are we more interested in conversion rate or money? And while you fundamentally understand this, and I know you fundamentally understand this, the people you are talking to may not. And when all we talk about is optimizing conversion rate and not optimizing revenue, we can actually get in the situation where, in fact, people are making the advice to cut the budget, marketing budget completely. Because once you get rid of marketing, your conversion rate skyrockets. Because only your most loyal customers will visit, and therefore they will all purchase. Hardly anybody else will. Your revenue will drop. But we're not talking about revenue. Revenue's not important. We're focused on conversion. And I see this situation happen over and over again, where we get so honed in on make the conversion better, make the conversion better, make the conversion better, that we get stuck and not ask the question, are we actually making the business worse? There's another problem with conversion rate, which is we actually don't know how the systems we use calculate it. In many cases, that detail is mysterious. So let's say we have a product that is... Uh, expensive, an insurance package, or a, a car, or a boat, or a large computer package, or something. We may have a person who visits four times before they're ready to press the buy button on that thing. If they visit four times with that buy, how do we count that conversion? Is it 25% because they technically count as four visitors? Or can we actually count the sessions and know that it's the same visitor each time? Which, by the way, the same IP address does not mean the same person. So how do we actually know it's the same person who is purchasing four times? So is that a 100% conversion or a 25% conversion? And do we ever explain that to the people who we're selling better conversion rates to? 
Do we actually know for sure that those numbers are being counted accurately? So this is key. And most importantly, conversion can't tell you why. It doesn't tell us what we need to do differently. I'm going to shift it up a little here, and I want to play a little game. I'm going to show you seven words. I want you to pick out the word that you think is different from the others. So here we go. Delightful, amazing, awesome, excellent, remarkable, incredible, satisfactory. Which word jumps out at you as being a little different? Satisfactory, yes, satisfactory, right? This is a fantastic word, we use it all the time. In fact, we put out satisfaction surveys because we believe that satisfaction is what we're seeking. Yet it's different, we don't put out remarkability surveys, we don't put out awesomeness surveys or delightful surveys, we just wanna find out if we're satisfactory. And this is such an interesting word that we've picked for ourselves because it's really not a great word. I mean, if we were talking about food, the equivalent word is edible. <laughs> we never talk about food being edible. Oh my God, dinner last night, you should have been there. It was so edible. <laughs> Nobody says this. So what are we saying when we say, did you find this experience satisfactory? Yes, it was satisfactory. I hate you, but it was satisfactory. <laughs> that describes pretty much every time I fly on United. <laughs> it is such a low bar for us to shoot towards. Why do we do this to ourselves? We can do so much better than going after satisfaction. And we do it in the most clumsy ways. I've got hundreds of awful satisfaction surveys. This is one from GoGo, and you probably can't read this, but it says up here, you are to rate the ease of connecting to the GoGo in-flight signal, SSID. I'm sure everybody who flies on an airline understands what the SSID for GoGo in-flight means to them and how easy it was to connect. And they've got this lovely five-point scale with this does not apply to me button. I wonder what the error rate is on that does not apply to me. They used the service, but they somehow didn't connect to the SSID. It's, 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 it's a wacky-ass thing, right? And the only way they can even send you this survey is if you actually logged in. So they know you connected. <laughs> What does this tell you? More importantly, let's say 62% are somewhat satisfied and management says we have to get that number up. What do we do differently? Part of this is embedded in the scale itself. So the social scientists have taught us that we have to start with a neutral, this, this very unambiguous thing in the middle. And then on either side, we put extremes, so satisfied or dissatisfied, that sounds right. And then the social scientists discovered that people don't like always picking the endpoints, and they'll pick a different point than the endpoint because, you know, no one's satisfying, so we're just not going to pick that. So we have to actually put in different degrees of satisfying, somewhat satisfied, extremely satisfied. Dinner was somewhat edible, but it wasn't extremely edible. What does that actually mean? Does the person sitting next to you have the same criteria for what pushes something down to somewhat satisfying as you do? When someone gives that a vote, does it mean anything? Probably not. So what do we do? We combine the numbers as if they're the same number, and then we report the statistics, and we still don't know what to do differently. We can fix this a little by actually taking the word satisfied and making it the neutral, because in fact, it is a neutral statement. Being satisfied is neutral. Right? It's, it's, it's the worst we want to be. So, and then we can say, okay, let's be delighted or frustrated. Because in fact, we want people to be delighted. 
by our stuff. We don't want them to be frustrated. It would be useful to know how many people were frustrated by our, our thing. That would be actually valuable. We still don't know what to do differently, but we at least have a sense that we are frustrating the hell out of our users. So we can work on frustration. But this is a five-point scale. The real sin starts to happen with 10-point scales. 10-point scales are a blight in social sciences. Right? We use 10-point scales because we want things to look scientific. And we use 10-point scales because we actually don't know what the difference between a 6 and a 7 means. <laughs> Except for Mike, he does. <laughs> and so we put these things on 10-point scales. So, so suddenly, our satisfaction drops from 7.8 to 7.6, and the memo goes out, whatever's happening, we need to fix that right away. What does this mean? And the surveys that have 20 questions of 10-point scales, this sends the message to your customer, we are trying hard not to care. <laughs> Nothing says, I don't care, like 20 pages of 10-point scales. They are not helpful at all. People use 10-point scales because it takes the noise of random distributions and makes it feel like science. The averages actually change. And then they get worse. They'll take a 10-point scale and they'll use decimal point precision. So we got an 8.76 last time, but this time we're only getting an 8.72. We need to focus, people. Let's focus. All right? we, and we don't even talk about what the margin of error, an easily calculated number is, to say, actually, that number is just noise. Almost always, changes in satisfaction scales are noise, yet we react to them as if they mean something. The worst offender of this is Net Promoter. Net Promoter can't stop at 10. They usually use an 11-point scale. And by working with an 11-point scale and this crazy little formula where they bias the data to the positive by subtracting the detractors from the supporters, that suddenly puts us in this case where you can have vice presidents going, we were at 7.6 last week and we're now at 7.2, our net promoter sucks, we need to fix this. But we still don't know what to do differently. We don't know why the numbers change, and therefore we can't make the inferences that get us to the design decisions. So what we need are metrics that actually help us understand how to improve the user experience. And the technique that I like to do is to start with a map a customer journey map. This is a tool that's been around for a long time but is now gaining a lot of prominence both in the design and the customer research side of things. And it's a fantastic tool to explain what is happening with our users. Now the way a customer journey map works is we take the things the customer does. So in this case, booking a hotel, these are all the steps that they go through to book a hotel. And we put it on a scale from extreme frustration to extreme delight. And then as we watch a particular customer go through the process, we mark on the page whether they are delighted at that moment or frustrated. We have them tell us where they are on that page and we mark that down. And suddenly, we have information we can make inferences from. Because we were watching the user work with the site, or the application, we can actually see where they were frustrated and what frustrated them. And we can get ideas as to what we could do differently to make that happen. And now we can make a list of all the things users find frustrating. Maybe the content's confusing. Maybe they can't remember their password. Maybe the navigation is either hidden or the terminology is just wacky. Or maybe the error messages are just driving them nuts because they're not helpful. And what's interesting about this is we can start to create 
metrics around these things. Let's take error messages, for example. Maybe we have an error message that shouts at the user that they need to remove all the dashes and spaces from their phone numbers. Right? This is an error message, by the way, I've never understood. Because it takes 10 lines of code to detect if a phone number has spaces and dashes that need to be removed and then to put up that error message. But it only takes one line of code to just take out the damn spaces and f dashes. <laughs> Why is this even an error message? Let people put in the number however they want. Right? But here it is. We give that number out. We make people put it in twice. Or maybe it's the error message that says that even though we put in that three-digit code on the back of our credit card, four digits if it's an Amex card, on the front of the Amex card, we didn't get it right because when we went to fix the spaces and the dashes in the phone number, it erased that number because it can't keep it because of uh, PCI compliance. Or maybe when the user went to log in, they got the dreaded username and password do not match. No, think, no thank you about the fact that we know that it's the right username, you just got the password wrong, but we're not going to tell you that because the guys with the tinfoil hat and security, they refuse to give any clues to the bad guys, so we're just going to say it could be either. And the thing is, these error messages, we know when the user gets them. And we also know that every time the user gets it, we've just made the experience a little more frustrating. So here's a pro tip. You can measure the frustration, which is a measure but not an analytic, because computers can't measure frustration. But you can measure the frustration through a proxy of counting the number of error messages your system gives out. But do you? I bet you you don't. Because it doesn't come in Google Analytics. You have to write some code to make that happen. Less code than it takes to put up the damn error message about the space and the dashes, but you still have to write it. And if you were to write it, and if you were to count it, suddenly you would have a measure of a whole bunch of frustrating points in your app. Do you know what the most delivered error message is? Have you actually seen people get that error message? Do you understand why people get that error message? Could you fix it so they never get that error message? So suddenly we have this tool by just counting error messages. But we can do better than that. A few years back, I got the chance to work with one of the 10 largest uh, e-commerce sites. And they were very interested in improving their checkout process. And they had tried all sorts of things, and whatever they tried wasn't working. And so they called on us to come in and help them figure out why were they having this issue with their checkout process. And so we, first thing we did was we went in and we said, OK, let's draw the map. What does your checkout process look like? And it was a pretty standard e-commerce checkout process. First you put in your shipping information, then you put in your billing information, then you put in your payment information, then you say, okay, yes, I want to purchase with this card, send it to this address, done, ready. Five steps. And they said, people are giving up. And they, 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 were, they were insistent. People are giving up. We need to figure out what people are giving up. Now, they had a million shoppers a day, so even the smallest number of people giving up, that's, that's decent money. Okay, so why are people giving up? And we said, how do you know people are giving up? And they pulled out their page view data, and their page view data, sure enough, had a clear line that shows that as people progressed, they were abandoning the process. Okay, it wasn't huge, but at a million visitors a day, you know, this starts to add up. So we're like, okay, that sounds good. We said, here's what we know about e-commerce. We need to watch people in order to understand why this stuff is happening. And in order to watch people on e-commerce, we actually need to get real shoppers. One of the things we learned a long time ago about studying e-commerce is if you ask people to pretend to shop, you get very different results than if you ask people who really are trying to buy something from the site. 
People who pretend to shop will go ahead and push buttons and don't care, knowing that this doesn't have any effect on their life. But if you have someone come in and buy a digital camera that they really want, and they're going to keep the digital camera, they will actually spend more time looking at things. And because these numbers were so small, we knew that we had to look at the real shoppers. So we said, we'd like to look at real shoppers. They said, OK, you could, we'll, do some, we'll do a round of usability tests with you, and you can watch real shoppers. So we'll get real shoppers in. I said, OK, and just for a baseline, we'd like to see what the data looks like before they get to checkout. So can we see the page views that lead up to checkout? They said, sure, and they grabbed them. And the page views looked like this. So we have two more steps, shop for the product, and then review for shopping cart. And sure enough, there's this big dip for review for shopping cart, way bigger than the dip they asked us to look at. And we said, um, shouldn't we look at this? And they said, no, no, no. So why not? I said, oh, we understand that. That's shopping cart abandonment. Very com common in e-commerce. I've heard this many times. Shopping cart abandonment. Sometimes it's like as much as 75% shopping cart abandonment. And I've always wondered about this, right? Because why doesn't this happen in real life? <laughs> I mean, how come when I go to Costco, there aren't a whole bunch of filled baskets lying around as if the uh, uh, rapture just hit and only the sinners are left to complete their sales transactions. <laughs> right? How come this never happens? Oh yeah, people just put stuff in their basket and then they decide not to buy. That never happens. I have watched thousands of people shop online. It never happens. Right? But no, no. That's out of scope for the project. We just want you to focus on that. Really? Oh, yeah, I know. We have a solution, they said. We know how to fix this. I said, really? They said, yes. Yes, our marketing people are doing it. Really? <laughs> yes. They've put together email campaigns. They're just going to email people until they buy the stuff in their cart. <laughs> OK, that'll work. Good. Let's move on. So we get out to our first usability test. And we expect to see this. Right? Very first participant, very first session. But that's not what we see. Suddenly we see that there's a bunch of extra steps. After they review the shopping cart, they don't go straight to the shipping information. Instead, they have to log into an account. And this particular participant could not, for the life of them, remember their username and password. They actually didn't know whether it was the username or the password that they had wrong, because the system said username and password does not match. And so they tried different usernames, and they tried different passwords, and they could not get a combination that worked together. So they ended up clicking on the request password reset. And when they clicked on the request password reset, that told them that it put an email, address, uh, put an email in their inbox. But they actually couldn't remember which email was associated with their account. So they had to try uh, uh, different email accounts to figure out which one had the email. And they finally got the reset, and they clicked on a link in the email, and that brought them to a page that required that they now put in a new password. And then, once they did that, it would then take them to a page that would let them put in their shipping information. So there were three extra page, four extra steps that we didn't know about that were not there. And so we went to the team and we asked them, can we get the data? for these three steps? And they said, yes, absolutely. We'll get right on that. And about an hour later, they come back and say, absolutely not. We don't have it. <laughs> and it turns out they don't have it because the tinfoil hat people don't trust Google Analytics, which is what they were using. $1.2 billion website using Google Analytics. Just think about that for a second. And that's what they were using for a tool. And they don't trust it. They don't like the third party thing. So the trust and fraud people who own all these pages refused to, to instrument them. So after getting a senior vice president into the loop, we got the trust and fraud people to instrument it. But now we had to wait two weeks before we had data that meant anything. So in the meantime, we thought, OK, what we're going to see is data that looks like this. right? We're going to see that this is going to explain that drop off, maybe. But the data actually didn't look like this. The data looked like this. 
And what it looked like was after the review shopping cart page, we saw the number of visitors skyrocket to three times for login to the account page. And this just baffled us. We had to go back and double check the data two, three times because this didn't make sense. You can't bookmark this page. It's got a session code in it. It'll come up with an error. So how could, people, how could three times as many people get to this page as we're getting to shopping cart review page, which is the only page you can get to this page from? And then when we checked the recent Crest password reset, we saw that the number had dropped again to actually below the review shopping cart page. So most people were dropping out at this point. And only two thirds of the people who actually went through the shopping process would actually get to this point. And then uh, there was another big drop on that link in the email. And then a small drop uh, for clicking on the email to reset and a slightly bigger drop for putting in a new password. And that's when it hit us. These weren't unique visitors. These were page refreshers. The system was counting page refreshes as visitors. And people were putting in, on average, three username password combinations before trying to reset the page. So it was just people trying multiple things. They didn't know what it was, so they'd try three things and then they'd give up. I'm never going to get this. And once we saw this in the lab, and we saw multiple users do this, and then we watched the analytics and we matched that up, we suddenly knew what was going on. So we asked a question, and this became the most important question. What is the value of all the shopping carts that get abandoned because someone can't figure out how to log in? And it turned out that this was, for this $1.2 billion a year company, not a huge number. It was only $300 million a year, a third of their revenue, a quarter of their revenue. Right? So then the team launched into a project. It was a, for them, it was not a hard project. In fact, it was one that had already been on the drawing boards for a while, and that was the ability to make a purchase without logging in, something they called guest login. And as soon as they implemented guest login, they saw sales jump by $300 million a year. In other words, we recovered those failed shopping carts. And this is the thing. What we managed to do was combine the qualitative research of watching users actually shop with the quantitative research of how, how often does this happen in the real world. And we were able to use custom metrics, not metrics that came out of the box, to actually tell us what was going on and the qualitative research, the actual sitting and observing users to tell us why it was happening. And the combination of those two things were extremely powerful. And I want to point out, this is custom metrics. This isn't time on page. This isn't bounce rate. This isn't percentage of search failures. This, this was a particular metric that only means something to this company which was the dollar amount that is being lost due to unrealized shopping cart value from password issues. That's all we looked at. That number was big enough. And we call this a footprint. Once we know to look for, this, for the footprint tracks in the data, we scan the data to find the footprints. How often do the footprints show up? And if we can find the footprints often enough, we can tie them to things like revenue. And since we know that any time these footprints happen, they are frustrating, we are also tying them to satisfaction. Satisfaction on a scale of frustration to delight. So we can actually look at these metrics and count them and tell what's going on. 
And by monitoring these metrics, we get a much better picture of what's going on than using the out-of-the-box metrics. We use qualitative findings to drive our quantitative research agenda. Now, I want to point out that the team had a bunch of inferences. And the inferences that they had were wrong. They thought that the checkout steps were where we were going to find the biggest improvement. Wrong. They thought it was normal to lose customers before checkout. Wrong. They thought that the cart review went straight to checkout without additional steps. Wrong. They thought that all the screens were instrumented. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I sound like Donald Trump. <laughs> they were wrong. They had all these inferences that they were running with, that they thought they were convinced were true, and we constantly have to be testing our inferences. The other thing to point out here is that we actually predicted this. We saw this in the lab. While we were waiting for this data to come in, we knew what it was going to say because of the journey maps. The journey maps told us that we had a huge dip around login. Once we got past that, we were good, but practically everybody in our, in our studies that we watched when we were doing usability testing had that dip. So we saw it coming. We knew what it was, and we knew how to apply the inferences once we got there. If you are really serious about doing quant, and I'm assuming since you're here, you're serious about doing quantitative analysis, Start by focusing on the frustration in your process, whether it's the frustration of buying, the frustration of signing up for something. Michael's little scenario, that was an extremely frustrating thing. Do you know what all the frustration points are? There's no way the data from that site would tell anybody what Michael went through. The only way to get to that information would be to watch Michael. And then ask the question, how often does this happen? How many times do people click on different demo buttons and get the same page? I bet you you would see that that number's huge. That's a footprint to track in your data that you can't track out of the box. There's no way you can just bring up Google Analytics and say, how many times are people refreshing this page by clicking on buttons that link back to it? But you can count it if you instrument your analytics to do that. And the only way you'd know to do that is by watching people, like Michael. Observations trump inferences. And I so wish we can get that verb back. <laughs> Got all the best verbs. People tell me they love my verbs. <laughs> when I talk to design teams about this, I get lots of excuses. They say things like, well, the analytics are, 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 are a different group. There's an analytics team, there's a customer research team, there's a customer experience team. They monitor analytics. We don't even know who they are. We don't know anything about them. They, have, they do their own magical thing. Of course, you know, the analytics team is like, I don't know what designers do. It's sort of magical. I don't know, understand. This is a problem. The thing is, the data only works when we combine it. So we have to figure out how to do this. We currently have an analytics team and a UX team. We need to combine them somehow. It doesn't really matter how. Just put them under new management. Make them work together. Because the minute we do that, we'll start to understand why the things we're seeing happen and what things we really need to be tracking. And when people say, oh, in our organization, that's, you know, they're, they're like in completely different buildings, that's impossible to do. At some level, this is just data science. This is DJ Patel. And he was President Obama's chief data scientist. President Obama had a data scientist. 
The White House doesn't even know how to run email servers, and they had a data scientist. I know this for a fact. I worked in the White House for a year. They, this is radical. And the thing about DJ is he's awesome. But there are lots of data scientists out there. I think data science is an essential bond between customer research and user research and design. And we need to understand how to use this. It's a, it's a skill set that all of us need to know better at. People tell us, I don't understand what bounce rate means. Well, it's because nobody understands what bounce rate means. <laughs> we have to not just accept that it means something important and accept the agenda that it's being pushed for. We actually have to ask the questions. We actually have to learn how to explain how we got to the numbers. We have to be good at questioning until everybody in the room understands the metric and where its flaws are and where its value is. Because without that, we're just running on hope. And particularly amongst the designers, this whole I'm not good with numbers thing, they gotta get over this. Because here's the thing, we can keep the numbers simple. If we do too complicated math, we lose everybody. So we always have to simplify it down. Counting up the dollar amount of the shopping carts that people abandoned because there was no, oh, because they had to reset their password, that wasn't higher math. That wasn't stats 201. That was a simple spreadsheet function, plus. All we did was sum up the numbers. That's all it was, and everybody in the room could understand it. And because summing up the numbers effed us with a big number, everybody in the room understood the implications. So we have to focus on that. So we need to apply targeted metrics to our qualitative research. This is really an important toolkit. So if you don't work with your designers now, you need to be bringing this in to the design team and working with them side by side and looking at what they're finding when they do their qualitative work. Design has a simple definition. It's the rendering of intent. And so the team has an intention, the product they want to build. They want people to, to use it in a certain way. Are they getting that intention? If you follow on the Twitters uh, an account like Astro Terry, Astro Terry was an astronaut for two years, and while he was in space, he uh, created a, a tremendous number of photographs that he took on the space station flight. And they were beautiful. And the really cool thing is, from Twitter, from whatever account you're in, you can see the pictures. You can see them right there. You don't have to do anything. Now contrast this with my friend Mike Montero's Twitter stream. He went to Japan, and when he posted his, Twitter, his pictures, they didn't show up. You had to click through to see the picture. And I recommend you always click through to see the picture. His pictures are great. But he had to do that because he posted on Instagram, not using Twitter. And a lot of people think, because what happened was, Instagram used to put the pictures up, but they stopped. And people think, whoa, that was because Twitter thought they were a competitor, so they shut down their ability to put pictures in. And they made it. But it turns out, no. The day it stopped was the day they were acquired by Facebook. And the day they were acquired by Facebook, Facebook asked Instagram to make it so you had to click through. They want you to click through because they want to increase what's called the monthly active users. It turns out that the way Instagram uh, measures its value isn't through revenue because, in fact, the company doesn't have a way to make money. So instead, 
what they do is they measure it in terms of the number of users, what they call monthly active users. And there's this myth that's going through Silicon Valley that the more monthly active users you have, the more valuable your property is. And there's valuation and monthly active users are highly correlated. And by the way, this is no more validated than counting the number of E's on the homepage. But yet, everybody believes this. And because everybody believes this, they change the design to support this. When you get an email from LinkedIn about a discussion group, they used to put the whole discussion question in the email. But now, no, you have to click through. You only get eight words, and then you have to click through to see what they did. Uh, on Facebook, they just tell you that someone commented on your post, but they don't tell you which post. So you have actually no idea what this means. You have to click on a link to get there, and that's how they make sure that they count you because they can't count emails because they have no easy way to count emails viewed. So they use this as active users. Uh, the director of design at Frog once said, the, Robert Fabricant, the medium of, be of design is behavior. When designers are actually crafting, they are changing behavior. And what we're seeing here are behaviors being changed. And things like Medium use these types of charts, but they're not really telling us much. They separate out views from reads, but we don't really know what a read is. So these things become very complicated. We need to make sure that we're not changing our design uh, uh, to get the metrics we want. We need to make sure that, that the design itself is getting the experience we want and use the metrics to understand what those elements should be. Let's just quickly go back to satisfaction. People get up at 4.30 in the morning and they sit outside their favorite Apple store to buy a product that just weeks before they were complaining about on Twitter how it wasn't innovative enough when the keynote was on. And yet they will be out there at 4.30 in the morning. These are pretty satisfied customers. Customers of Harley Davidson feel so empowered about the Harley Davidson brand that they decide that they want to be part of a community that identifies themselves. So they go ahead and they tattoo the Harley Davidson logo in the most awkward places on their body. I mean, this is branding in the primal definition of the term. And there's a whole group of us who are uh, uh, fascinated with United's ability to take any reasonable experience and just create something even more unreasonable than ever before. And so we try to measure this stuff. We think this works, but it doesn't. But there are instruments out there that do. There's one called the Constant Customer, or called the CE11. It's uh, uh, put out by folks at the Gallup organization. And this is a fantastic instrument. And really what it is, is they've taken 11 different questions. It's the Customer Engagement 11. And of these 11 different statements, you either agree or don't agree with them. And they are little statements like, this product's company always delivers what they promise, right? United gets dinged on that all the time. Or, I'm always proud to be a customer of this product's company. That explains the Harley Davidson logo, uh, logo tattoo thing. Or, I can't imagine a world without this product's company. That explains sort of the Apple approach to, Apple customer approach to sitting outside the store at 4.30 in the morning to be first to get the product, right? And the nice thing about this scale, these 11 questions, is that they actually give us a solid understanding with a very simple instrument. We measure it using three values, either I agree with the statement or I don't, or I'm not sure. And that gives us a scale that goes from minus 11 to plus 11. And we can explain exactly what it looks like. And when we did this, we actually saw what happened. So we were doing one of our e-commerce studies. We were watching a bunch of people shop. And what we saw was that there were five different websites that they were shopping from. And we measured both before and after of the brand. 
And you can see that Amazon dropped from 6.2 to 5.5. Best Buy dropped from 4.5 to 4.3. Dell dropped from 3.0 to 1.4. HP went negative in the shopping experience. And Walmart, Walmart went up. This is called uh, uh, increasing satisfaction by lowering expectations. <laughs> People came in not thinking Walmart was going to be that great, and it went up. But keep in mind, it's still lower than HP started at and lower than Dell ended at. But this is, this is what happens. And this is by taking the simple survey at the beginning at the end. And we do this in the qualitative studies. So because we're doing this while we're watching people, we can actually see what drove the measure. And as a result, not only do we know why, what numbers change, but we know why they change. We know what was wrong with each shopping experience and what we could do to fix it. And if you want more information on this, you can, uh, I put together a link and then I just realized, you know, you could just Google Gallup CE11, that's what I always do, so <laughs> go for that. And that's what I came to talk to you about, that um, metrics improve the uh, experience, but we have to know which ones. We got to make sure we don't jump from observations to inferences too soon. We have to custom build our metrics that match our business and what's going on. And finally, we have to start taking data science really seriously across the organization, not just in the analytics portion, but throughout the organization. And the data scientists have to be able to speak the language of the designers and the engineers. Uh, if for some reason you found this to be the least bit interesting, uh, we've written a bunch of this at UIE.com, our website there. Uh, we, uh, you can reach me if you have questions at jspool at UIE.com. Uh, also, you can, if you work in design and we're not connected on LinkedIn, please connect to me because it's a great way for us to talk to each other. And finally, you can follow me on the Twitters at at JMSpool where I tweet about design, design strategy, design experience, and the amazing customer service policies of the airline industry. Uh, thank you very much. We have, I think we have, we have time for just a couple of questions, if we could change here. And just, I want to say thank you, Jared. This is one of the best presentations I've seen in a very long time. Well, you good. Touched, I'm sure the other ones will be better. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But you touched on so many important points. And as we saw in the stats in the beginning, we have a lot of people here who have maybe only been in the business for a year. And I think a lot of what you went through here will accelerate them far beyond that. So thank you so much. OK. Um, the top question here is about the NPS. And it revolves around whether uh, NPS using a follow-up question to ask why you gave that score, uh, what your take is on that, if that's good. My experience with asking users why they gave a generic score, you know, would you recommend us to a friend, right? For all I complain about United, I will always recommend United to anybody in Boston because of all the other choices, they are the least evil. Okay. <laughs> and I can put that in the form, but that doesn't help anybody at United know what to do differently. Nope. And so the problem is, is that oftentimes the, uh, the users who are filling out the form, they actually don't know what is causing their reaction to it at that moment. And we've had people fill out MPS, and the reason that they didn't like it was something that happened three years ago. So it's, it's, you have to be able to tie it to the actual behavior. And the MPS is not tied to any behavior, so we don't know what to change in the design. Yes. And the second uh, popular question here was, how do you actually track the customer journey? How do you know the path sequence, not in GA, which is statistics? The, the, the short version of the answer. Oh, the short answer is you watch them. You sit next to them, and you see what's going on. Now, GA will tell you flows, and you can see if that matches up to what happens in your lab. But really, at the time, you're just, you spend a lot of time watching people sh use your site. And if you're not watching real people use your site, you are missing a wealth of data that could be valuable to you, and you will end up not getting what you want. So, so you definitely need to spend more time watching. Uh, the minimum amount of time is two hours every six weeks for every member of the team. So you and everybody else needs to be spending that kind of time watching real people use real designs. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for encouraging my behavior.